You're in the Waterloop. Welcome to Waterloop, the podcast helping water leaders to discover solutions and drive change. I'm the host, Travis Loop. How can we take public opinion polls and turn them into policy? That's the focus of this episode. In a recent poll, U.S. voters overwhelmingly agreed that water is a human right, clean waterways are important, and infrastructure investments are critical. Those poll results are encouraging by themselves, but the real value is in how to take those results and turn them into policy. We're going to hear about how to do that in this episode with Nicole Lampy of Waterhub, Yasmin Zarpour of Policy Link, and Jennifer Collins of the National Wildlife Federation. They talk about the value of polls and how they can be used to test language, create messages, and influence policy. They talk about opportunities to use the poll results to shape specific policies such as jurisdiction of the Clean Water Act, financial assistance with water bills for low-income Americans, and the upcoming Farm Bill. Now to the conversation where we learn how to turn polls into policy. Waterloop. Welcome to Waterloop. For this conversation, we're going to talk about the power of polling and kind of taking polls and turning it into policy asks and messaging. Have a great panel of guests for this conversation here, joined by three folks. Uh, Nicole Lampy, who is Managing Director of Water Hub. Also have Yasmin Zarpour. She is Director of Water Equity and Climate Resilience at Policy Link and uh, Jennifer Collins. She is acting director of the Clean Water for All Coalition for the National Wildlife Federation. So uh, you, there was some recent polling that was conducted, and the results are out. Uh, and before we kind of dig into how you take poll results, turn them into messaging, turn them into policy asks, and so forth. Uh, Could you talk, I think, Nicole, about this recent poll? What were the top findings? Any surprises that jump out at you? Um, So this is a national voter poll that we conducted in June of this year. Um, We polled just over 2,100 voters. And um, the goal was really to understand more about what water issues are top of mind for voters this year. And some of the findings that stood out to me that I think are are really heartening in general are, at first, just near universal agreement. Uh, 89% of voters agree that water is a human right. Um, Similarly, on clean water, uh, 96% said that it's important that rivers, lakes, and streams be safe for wildlife. And about 9 in 10 said the same for drinking. Um, You know, drought has historically been... Um, perceived as a Western issue, although of course we know the Mississippi River right now is at historically low levels. Um, And and we're really seeing that reflected in the polling. 84% of voters are concerned about the Western drought. And when we ask them why, what worries them, wildfires, food prices, and fish and wildlife impacts topped the list. And then, you know, we polled about infrastructure priorities last year. And this year we asked a bunch more questions about how we ought to allocate those dollars. Um, And 81% of voters said it's very important that infrastructure investments deliver safe drinking water. Um, You know, also high marks for, you know, preventing sewage spills, for preventing pollution generally. Um, Interestingly to me, um, just 70% said it's very important that infrastructure investments help communities prepare for future fires, droughts, and floods. Um, And then Jenny's going to get a lot more into the specific questions that we asked around food and farming. Um, But one thing that stood out to me was the fact that when we asked voters, like, what should our top goals be for farm policy in the United States? They said that protecting public and environmental health were higher priorities than keeping store shelves stocked, which I think is really remarkable in this year when there have been so many challenges Um, you know, with supply chain, you know, during the pandemic, as well as the war in Ukraine, the voters still see, they understand that environmental health means, you know, (laughs) productive fields, um, as well as healthy people. Hmm. Uh, So getting 80 to 90% of voters to 
to uh, have the same position on any and anything is a crazy high number, right? We know how divided people are on so many things in this country. Uh, so that is just powerful that you've got, like you said, near agreement on the importance of clean water and all these connected measures there. Very, very cool. Um, well, Yasmin and Jenny, I'd like to hear a little bit more from your perspectives about what kind of stood out to you from the poll results, you know, and, and what's most relevant to your work and, and your organizations. Um, so we've known for a long time that people generally are really concerned about pollution to their waterways. Gallup polling over the years has shown that pollution uh, to rivers and streams usually ranks as the top or one of the top environmental concerns. But this polling was really helpful um, to see that that number holds and that 96%, as Nicole said, said it, that um, it's important that rivers, lakes, and streams be safer fish and wildlife and 89% for drinking, even with only about a third knowing much about the Clean Water Act. So even with limited knowledge about the act, people are still just really care about seeing protections for their local um, water bodies. And this is especially important right now in light of a Supreme Court case uh, called Sackett versus EPA, um, which was just heard earlier this month in which the court will decide what waters can and cannot be protected under the Clean Water Act. Um, so people clearly value clean water and want protections for their local rivers and streams. This all helps give us important data on the need to make the case to the public on what the Clean Water Act is, what it's done, and what more we need to do to ensure clean water for all. Mm. Makes me just think a little bit like the 4% that that didn't think that there should be clean water in the in their rivers and streams, right? Or the eleven percent that didn't think it needed to be clean for source of drinking water. Like, hmm, what do you what do you think then? Uh, um, Yasmin, love to hear your perspective uh, on this polling and and how it relates to your organization. Thanks, Travis. Um, so I work at Policy Link. We're the National Research and Action Institute. <laughs> working to advance racial and economic equity by lifting up what works. Um, and in part of my role as Director of Water Equity and Climate Resilience, I co-chair the Water Equity and Climate Resilience Caucus with Colette Schoen battle uh, from Taproot Earth, formerly known as the Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy. And the idea behind the caucus was really to pull together um, a space for frontline communities, communities of color, and low-income communities to develop their federal policy priorities together based on their lived experience. And so now the caucus is a national network of nearly 100 organizations that work to advance um, equity and resilience. And uh, really the work that we do is at the intersection, I would say, of water, justice, and climate. Hmm. Um, and so there were several sort of findings from this poll that were very relevant to us. The first... Um, then Nicole already mentioned that 89% agree that water is a human right. That is a large part of sort of the narrative change that we're trying to push for. A second is that uh, safe drinking water was considered very important by a large majority, and that's a bipartisan issue. Um, and then slightly less than that, but still a majority, do support the idea of providing water assistance. So how does that relate to our work? Um, recently, a Dig Deep report came out that 2.2 million individuals lack access to running water um, or sanitation. And this is especially true for communities of color. And so we know that safe drinking water is considered important by everyone. Um, and with the passing of the bipartisan law last November, uh, it was a really good sort of indication of federal commitment to water infrastructure, and it was a good start. We need a lot more money. Um, and we all have a role in playing to make sure that, that those finances or the investments actually reach the communities that need them the most. Um, so how it connects back to our work we know that water is becoming unaffordable for a lot of different communities. So there was a Guardian analysis from 2010 to 2018 of 12 U.S. cities that highlighted an average increase in water and sewer bills of 80%. And there, there 
was shown a uh, greater burden for the poorest households. So bills had become almost universally unaffordable for the poorest households. And what that means is that a lot of these households have to make the decision between paying their water bills and paying for food and other necessities, which is something that, again, if the majority of our country believes that human, that water is a human right, no family should have to make that decision. Hmm. We also know that a lot of cities use water shutoffs as a punitive measure for not paying and that water shutoffs disproportionately affect black and brown families. And as we saw during the pandemic, the uh, water shutoffs have a negative adverse effect on public health. In some states, they can lead to losing your house if a lien has been put on your house. Uh, in some states, it can mean losing your kids. Um, and so all this is to say that we know that we have a water affordability problem <clears throat> and that it's going to take substantial federal investment even beyond the bipartisan infrastructure law to upgrade our water infrastructure. While we're working on this problem of water affordability, we also need to set up um, a national permanent low-income water assistance program to ensure that no family's water is shut off. Um, and so that's been a main policy priority for the Water Equity and Climate Resilience Caucus. Hmm. Uh, what we've seen again with the polls is that even though they're, you know, water is recognized as a human right, even though folks understand the importance of having access to safe drinking water, that um, the percentage of folks that also recognize the importance of keeping services affordable is closer to 70%. So we still have a lot of work to do in emphasizing the need both for water affordability as the sort of goal in the long run, and then as a short-term fix, uh, standing up a permanent low-income water assistance program. Hmm. A lot of good stuff there. Uh, the idea of water as a human right is something that's come up on this podcast more frequently and seems to be gaining traction in the U.S., right? It's been used uh, kind of internationally for a long time um, and wasn't really used in reference to the, the United States to hear um, that 2.2 million people in this country don't have like clean, safe drinking water or access to sanitation is shocking. Uh, and maybe that's kind of been part of this recognition that water is a human right, that that's just unacceptable for anyone to have to have those kind of conditions. So good stuff. All right, let's get a little, little wonky here. A um, little inside baseball, if you will. Uh, when you do a poll like this, um, I wanted to kind of ask about messaging and policy. Um, I, I want to ask about how you can use a poll to test messages because that comes before taking the results and turning them into to messages and policy. But how do you use the way you phrase questions and what goes in polls to test messaging? You're, a, you're an organization. You all are with your organizations. You do messaging. How do you use a poll to, to develop the words you use and so forth? Um, I, I'm happy to start. Um, sure. So, you know, in polling, you can actually test messages. The way you, you do that typically is you first ask voters how much they support a policy um, action. So, for instance, um, you know, do you support creating a low income water bill assistance program, as Yasmin um, indicated, as a priority of the Water Equity and Climate Resilience Caucus? And then following that question, you ask them which of these arguments would be most likely to persuade you or would be most convincing as a reason to support a low income water bill assistance program. And you can test a range of messages and often we will actually like separate out the messages. So there might be a set of messages that's about, you know, um, the human right. There might be a set of messages that's about health. Um, there might be a set of messages that's about, you know, justice. Um, and then often after serving these messages, we'll retest the original policy action. And so if we've only asked half of voters, for instance, about health messages, and they then jump up in support for the, um, the bill, then we know that the health messages are the most effective. Hmm. Um, we also often test 
various ways to phrase solutions in a poll. So for instance, in our poll, um, because infrastructure spending is such a hot topic for you know all levels of government right now, from states on up to federal agencies, um, we asked, and because you know the Biden administration has indicated that that equitable or just spending is a priority, we tested support for um, different phrasing around who should be prioritized. Um, we asked if we ought to prioritize frontline communities, vulnerable communities, disadvantaged communities, communities that have high rates of asthma, heart disease, and other pollution-related health challenges, or communities that are at high risk of fires, flooding, and other disasters. Um, and what we found is that describing the risks or impacts actually generated greater support. So even though vulnerable essentially means at high risk of um, you know, experiencing disasters or frontline or disadvantaged often correlates with you know, those higher levels of disease, um, unpacking the terms and actually describing the risk or the impact generated higher support. Um, and just one more nerdy factoid, typically when we describe solutions, the simpler and more familiar the language, the higher the support. So Walton Family Foundation, for instance, um, did a World Water Day poll this year in which they tested a bunch of drought responses. And they asked voters um, how important it was to, to ensure sustainable uses of water. Um, and I think 48% of people said yes. And then they asked how important it was to practice conservation, which essentially means the same thing. Um, maybe not to water managers, there may be different levers that you pull, but essentially what we're talking about is wise use of water, right? Um, well, sustainable conservation or practicing conservation generated much more support because it's a, it's a concept hmm. that is familiar to voters that, you know, those of us who live in the West have been urged to do for our entire lives. And so I think the plainer the language, the gener generally the higher support, and that is, you know, that is something that we consider when we're talking about what the name is to attach to legislation, what sort of headlines we're trying to generate in the press. How are we going to talk about it with voters and with, you know, residents that we're trying to organize to get involved? Um, so, you know, thinking about benefits and thinking about simple, clear language is generally what polling indicates um, is most effective. We will return to the conversation in just one minute after a word about our sponsor, Varuna. Water systems are facing more requirements and challenges than ever before and have to stay aware and adapt in real time. Enter Varuna. The dynamic web-based tool helps water utilities to stay resilient by identifying more than two dozen risks that are both internal and external. These include all the typical risks that systems have to deal with and also a variety of newer factors, such as climate change and environmental justice. Not only does Varuna track risks, but it makes recommendations on actions to take and then changes status in response to measures the utility takes. And because public engagement is so important, Varuna provides information that can be shared with others, including customers. With Varuna, better data means better decisions. Learn more at Varuna.city and let them know you heard about it on Waterloop. Waterloop. Is there anything, uh, you know, Yasmin or Jenny, that you want to add on to that uh, from your experience being involved with polling? Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the thing that came out for us is when Nicole mentioned about using the language frontline, we obviously use that language a lot. Um, and so that has got us thinking internally about how do we um, start listing out the types of challenges that the communities that we work with are facing rather than sort of the shorthand of, you know, frontline communities, communities of color and so on. Hmm. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. It's it's kind of the terminology that we are all used to working inside these spaces, right? We know we know what it means shorthand, like you said. <clears throat> but when you're talking about these uh, issues to policymakers, to the public, to the media, uh, there's a lot there's a lot more <laughs> that could be explained as to as to what it, what's meant there. So you kind of touched on this, Nicole, but I'm just curious still to, to push a little further. You get these poll results or you get any poll results. Um, could you talk more about how then you take, take the numbers, take what people said, 
turn that into messaging and also turn it actually into specific policy asks or, and then how you use that stuff to approach uh, elected officials or government agencies and so forth. Um, well, you know, the way we use it is to demonstrate to decision makers that the public is with them in um, taking action on the issues that, you know, we're advocating around. So, um, for instance, you know, we tested water affordability, a low income water bill assistance program. We've actually been testing that um, for a couple of years now. And when we see strong support, that becomes fodder for, you know, lobby visits, whether you're talking about the state level or the or the federal level. Um, as well as for, you know, news stories, encouraging reporters to write in that, um, you know, 70% of voters support a low income rate assistance program, even if that means that their water bills will go up. Mm. Um, so it's, it's providing political cover for decision makers to take those actions. Um, and it's not just elected officials, you know, often, um, you know, the nitty gritty of um, implementing, for instance, clean water protections falls to appointed officials, and still they need political cover to be, for instance, aggressive about enforcement and monitoring. Um, and so I think the more that we can show the public cares about this, this is actually a priority for voters, um, the more that we can get those um, those people in power to um, be bold in their you know defense of the environment as well as public health. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good stuff. All right. Well, you you all have mentioned a few different specific things that are on the horizon or happening now, uh, and so I'm just curious about what opportunities there are to to uh, take what we learned about voters' positions and public support for these different issues and so forth, and apply it to you know specific again programs, legislation, whatever it might be that's that's happening out there. What are what are some of the opportunities that are that are on the horizon? So we have um, an upcoming congressional briefing that we're doing um, both to communicate the need for water affordability. As I mentioned, through the poll we see and just through our engagement, we see that there's a lot of work to be done in um, connecting that human right to water to affordable water. Um, so that's one of our top lines. And the second is really pushing for, again, the establishment of a permanent low-income water assistance program. So we have a temporary program through HHS, um, the low-income water assistance program. Um, but that's only funded for another year for now. Uh, the rollout has been obviously really hard. We have other types of assistance programs um, for energy, for example, for phone, so on and so forth. Um, so it seems strange that we don't have one for water. And this type of poll is really helpful so that when we go to our congressional briefing, we can make it clear to all the folks in the room that this is a bipartisan issue, that everybody wins if we can help ensure that every individual in the U.S. has access to clean, affordable water mm. um, and that there is strong bipartisan support for this. Mm. Yeah, that that LIWAP, Low Income Water Assistance Program, right? Like it came out of the COVID times and needing to help people. Um, and yeah, I kind of had that thought that all the other basic human needs have some type of program that helps people housing, food right uh the, their their power bills uh to keep heat on and this is the one area right food water shelter that's what you need to live <laughs> um and so this is the one area that doesn't have that that assistance yeah um jenny do you have some thoughts on opportunities that are out there right now to kind of use poll results like this and, and advance the policy yeah, absolutely. So we're looking at, um, you know, a, a potential an EPA rulemaking coming out um, around the under the Clean Water Act, what waterways are actually protected under the Clean Water Act that will be really important, as well as the Supreme Court ruling. So paying a lot of attention to those and waiting to see what um, what about with those, and then we can use the polling to help with how we respond and those are already influencing how we consider our next step based on what we expect to see from those different 
uh, the ruling and uh, rule makings. And then beyond this important Clean Water Act work I mentioned, have been talking about, our coalition members are also actively working uh, to prioritize solutions that reduce agricultural runoff and improve water quality. And so the polling around you know, 88% of people concerned about agricultural runoff, including pesticides and chemical fertilizer and manure, really helps buoy our work, in particular going into a year where Congress will be um, working on a new farm bill, which is a piece of legislation that has to be updated every five years and includes these really important conservation programs, which pay for practices that reduce soil erosion and nitrogen and phosphorus pollution to waters and improve water efficiency in dry climates. They're the largest source, uh, the, these conservation programs are the largest source of funding on private lands, yet in uh, fiscal year 2020, only less than one third of eligible program applications actually received funding under these various programs. So no, uh, the polling information showing that 80% of voters support doubling the amount of conservation funding in the Farm Bill is really encouraging and that public opinion can help push political will and having such a show of support can help in our a lot in our advocacy especially as you know we work with people who can tell these important stories of mm -hmm. you know how these different protections or funding programs have really um you know impacted them and um or they've been impacted by pollution that these funding programs and programs would help solve yeah, yeah, good, good stuff. A lot of people don't realize that the Farm Bill is a great tool for addressing water quality issues. Um, and it's something I've also heard talked about a lot more recently. So good opportunities. All right, good, good opportunities to use the power of polls here uh, to communicate and to change policy. So to all three of you, Nicole, Yasmin, Jenny, thank you so much for coming on and, uh, and talking about this. We'll definitely link to the poll in the, in the podcast description and um, look forward to people learning about it. Thank you both. Thank you all of you rather for, for this. Thanks. Thanks for having us, Travis. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the podcast, and thank you to this episode's sponsor, Varuna. To find all episodes, sign up for email updates, and connect on social media, visit waterloop.org. Waterloop, Waterloop.